Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's Lacta Hub workshop, exploring the benefits of breastfeeding and breast milk. This Lacta Hub workshop is a pre-event to the first AMREF International University Primary Healthcare Congress um, taking place at the end of the month. Thank you very much for joining. I'm Arancha de la Orra. I'm a nurse, a midwife, and a clinical research specialist at the Global Health Network and I will be facilitating today's session. In today's session, international experts will explore the global significance of breastfeeding, the nutrients in breast milk, its immediate and long-term health advantages for children, and its positive effects on maternal health. This workshop has been brought to you by AMREF International University and the Global Health Network at the University of Oxford. So just before we start, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared on Lacta Hub and the Global Health Network. If you're joining us on Zoom, please ask your questions in the Q&A section and we will answer as many questions as possible during the webinar Q&A session later on. Please use the chat box to introduce yourself. Your camera has been automatically deactivated and all microphones muted. And if you wish to receive a certificate of attendance for this workshop, you will need to complete the feedback survey. The link will be sent at the end of this session. Certificates will only be issued to participants who attend at least 80% of the workshop. And if you've got any technical issues, if you cannot hear us or see us, please check your computer preferences, close all the programs, check your sound level, and if the issue persists, you may need to close and restart the Zoom meeting. And if none of this works, please type these problems, um, these issues in the chat box and the team will aim to assist you. Next slide, please. Today, we will start this workshop introducing our international experts. Dr. Alice Lakati. She is a seasoned epidemiologist and a public health expert with more than 20 years of distinguished performance. She is the first and current director of the Research and Community Extension at AMREF International University, an affiliate of AMREF Health Africa in Kenya. Dr. Sutantri. She is a lecturer in community nursing and head of a school of nursing at the Universitas Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta in Indonesia. She has a particular interest in health promotion and disease prevention, policy making, cardiac rehabilitation, tobacco control, communicable and not communicable disease management, community nursing, as well as feminist research and the based analysis. Esther. Niyokabe Kimani, she has a bachelor degree in education and MA in child study and human development. She's also a certified doula, a Lamasa certified child birth educator, certified nutrition advisor, certified lactation, uh, lactation specialist, and also certified infant and young child nutrition specialist and from Kenya. And Millie Wanjiro Karina, she is an exceptional advocate for maternal, infant, and child health, but boasting an impressive range of qualifications and expertise, expertise with over 15 years of experience in the healthcare industry. She has established herself as a dedicated public health specialist, registered nurse, and midwife, and board certified lactation consultant in Kenya. Next slide, please. This is our agenda for today's workshop. Dr. Ali Sakati will start with a welcome from AMREF International University, followed by our three international experts. And finally, we will open the floor to questions from the audience. Next, thank you. And before uh, we start, just a recap or now on today's objectives. So today's session will focus on understanding the global impact of breastfeeding, recognizing the nutritional benefits of breast milk, identifying immediate and long-term health benefits for children, understanding benefit, uh, breastfeeding's influence on maternal health, and promoting breastfeeding for a sustainable future. And now, Dr. Alice Lakati will start today's session. Welcome, 
Dr. Alice Lacati, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Arancha, for that kind introduction. Um, I want to welcome all of us to this webinar, which uh, Amref International University is excited to host this pre-Congress webinar in preparation for uh, the upcoming Congress that uh, is coming up on 29th November to 1st of December here in Nairobi. So colleagues, um, delighted, I recognize a number of you in this session uh, and we are really excited to have all of us uh, come and discuss um, the benefits of breast milk and breastfeeding, which is an area of my interest and passion, as well as an area that I've really researched on. Um, AMRAF International University uh, is going to host the first primary healthcare congress here in our campus in Nairobi from 29th to 1st December. The theme of this Congress is going to look at aligning practice to evidence in strengthening primary health care for lasting health change in Africa. We would like to invite all of us to come and interrogate this uh, theme because uh, as the African continent, we are asking ourselves, are the primary health systems advised by local evidence? And uh, there are so many things that really make us we really look at this. Uh, 40 years after Alma Ata, we need to come together and deliberate on this theme. And uh, part of this Congress, we shall also be having a workshop that is looking at uh, breastfeeding. Next slide. So colleagues, I want to introduce us again to AMREF International University, which is an affiliate of AMREF Health Africa. We are a Pan-African university that is focused on training the health workforce for the primary healthcare systems in Africa. We believe that uh, the greatest impact uh, or the greatest change in achieving lasting health change is if we have the right workforce who can work in our primary healthcare systems. So as a university, we have these four strategic objectives. One of them is to develop fit for purpose leaders to serve in the primary healthcare system. Another of our strategic objective is to provide a training ecosystem that promotes equitable access to health sciences education. We know that we cannot solve the problem of a shortage of human resource in marginalized communities if we don't deal with the issue of access to health sciences education. Our next strategic objective as a university that is focused on primary health care is executing evidence-based practice for stronger primary health care systems in Africa. And finally, we are also working on bridging the gap between knowledge and practice so that our graduates come out with the right skills uh, ready to serve in the primary healthcare systems. Next slide. So colleagues, uh, as already said by Arancha, this workshop is a pre-Congress uh, a webinar that is going to just tell us what is going to happen in the workshop. So we are already working with a number of partners who are part of our sponsors as well as co-conveners. You may recognize some of those logos, you may not, but I just want to highlight that this webinar uh, is uh, our Congress is having a number of local and international partners you may recognize Lactation Hub is there, the Global Health Network, we have the African Population and Research Center, Nairobi County, uh, which is the city of Nairobi, the county government of Nairobi. We have Jaramogi Odinga Odinga University. We have the Africa Public Health Students Initiative. We have a health right and 
all these organizations that are listed here being part of this Congress. And I, I, and is, I was also want to mention the Community Health Services Association, the Center for Public Health and Development. Next slide. So for links, this Congress is going to tackle these four sub-themes. Uh, the first the sub-theme is going to look at evidence-based community approaches, uh, models that strengthen equitable access to primary health care services in Africa. Our next sub-theme is going to look at social determinants of health. If you have been in a public health class, you will this is probably one of the first topics you learn about social determinants of health. But you know that in the health sector, this is an area that we shy away from. Colleagues, social determinants of health becomes an important area that uh, we must tackle, we must discuss. The next sub theme is going to look at priority primary health care service delivery that transform health of communities. We need to ask ourselves, 40 years since Alma Hatta, what has changed in our communities? Which are the priority primary health care interventions? These are areas of RMNK, that mental health, NCDs, and many of those that are going to be discussed in the conference. The other sub-theme is looking at interventions that leverage emerging global health issues. These are aspects about climate change, advances in technology, and the global health security. And finally, we shall also discuss a theme of evidence-based, evidence for system strengthening. We want to interrogate the issue of social accountability, health leadership, management, health financing. So we welcome you to be part of this Congress uh, as we discuss how we can uh, align evidence in strengthening primary health care for lasting health change. Next slide. Uh, in this Congress, uh, we have already had a number of partners who, have, who are coming to take up panels. So uh, I want to excite us to be part of this Congress. One of them is Lactation Hub. They're going to run a, a session on empowering primary health care workers for better child and maternal health. We have the African Population and Research Center that is going to have a session on implementation research. We have the Africa Public Health Students Association that are going to look at a number of areas that is a training of antimicrobial resistance. These are things that are happening in our settings. We have um, one of the projects within the university that is going to look at digital innovations for primary health care. We have a UNFPA working with us. They are going to look at areas of sexual and reproductive health rights. And we have the Reproductive Health Network looking at the global SRH issues. So you can see that the workshop, uh, the Congress is apart from the scientific abstracts that we have already received from over, over 20 countries. And we are going to have 126 presentations, 115 posters, in addition to that, we are going to have these panels. So what do we expect from this Congress? We are going to have 305 abstracts that are going to be presented in either in the scientific format or in the best practices. We are going to have scientists, researchers from various countries. That includes Kenya, Zambia, Ethiopia, just to mention a few. You will have an opportunity to network. You'll have an opportunity for capacity building and interact with some of the keynote speakers. So I welcome you to visit the website and I welcome all of us to join this Congress. And once again, I welcome us to this webinar today 
which is a pre-Congress webinar. Uh, next slide, as I finish. So I hand over the mic to the next presenter. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, and we look forward to having you in our Congress in Nairobi. Thank you, Dr. Alice Lakati. Um, now I hand the floor to Dr. Sutantri to present why breastfeeding is important. Thank you very much, Arantia. Uh, do my voice clear? Yeah. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Uh, good evening, especially from Indonesia. It's an honor for me to be able to speak here today in this Lacta Hub workshop. And I'm here today to discuss about the importance of breastfeeding as well as the significance of breastfeeding in the context of achieving sustainable development goals or SDGs. As we know that the WHO and the UNICEF recommend beginning breastfeeding within one hour of a child's birth, exclusive breastfeeding for at least the first six months of the child's life and introduction of nutritious complementary foods after six months. Along with this recommendation, the WHO and the UNICEF also suggest that mothers continue breastfeeding until the child is at least two years old. In this case, breastfeeding is not just a fundamental act of nurturing a child, it is also a powerful tool in our efforts to create a better, more sustainable world for all. However, before we delve into the reasons why breastfeeding is a crucial aspect of the SDGs, let me begin this presentation by exploring the benefits of breastfeeding in general. So uh, the benefits of breastfeeding, first we start with the nutritional benefits of breast milk. Breast milk, breast milk itself is often referred to as liquid gold for a reason. It contains all the essential nutrients, vitamins, and minerals a baby needs for optimal growth and developments. It is the perfect balance of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats tailored to the specific needs of the infant. Breastfeeding, second, breastfeeding provides health benefits for both mother and infant. Breastfeeding is associated with a lower risk of allergies in asthma in children, and breastfeeding also offers lasting health benefits for both mother and child. And breastfed babies have lower risk of, of asthma, obesity, type 1 diabetes, and sudden infant death syndrome. Breastfed babies are also less likely to have ear infection and stomach bugs. And also, mother who breastfeed may also experience a reduced risk of breast and ovarian cancer, type 2 diabetes, and high blood pressure, which I'm sure about the benefits of uh, breastfeeding for mother and infant will be explored further by the second and the third speaker. And the third is the contribution to reducing child mortality and improving overall health. In 2020, there were 5 million children who died before the age of five years due to pneumonia and other lower respiratory diseases, preterm births and neonatal disorders, diarrheal diseases, congenital defects, and also infectious diseases. That is about 13,600 children who die per day globally. Exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life is essential to reduce child mortality and promote optimal health outcomes. Next slide, please. Despite all the potential benefits that I just mentioned before, less than half of all newborns or only 47% are put to breast within an hour of birth. This practice actually varies widely among regions with the prevalence of early initiation of breastfeeding in Eastern Europe and Central Asia is around 72%, nearly twice as high compared to South Asia, which is only 39%, and also East Asia and Pacific, which is only 41%. Putting newborns to the breast within the first hour of life, known as early initiation of breastfeeding, 
is critical to newborn survival and to establish breastfeeding over the long term. When breastfeeding is delayed after birth, the consequences can be life-threatening and the longer the newborns are left waiting, the greater their risk of death. In addition, as we can see from the second uh, right picture, less than one in two or 48% of infants zero to five months old uh, worldwide are exclusively breastfed. So it is South Asia has the highest prevalence of exclusive breastfeeding with over 60% of infants being exclusively breastfed. In contrast, only 26% of infants zero to five months in Northern America are exclusively breastfed. Next slide, please. So, uh, Talking about the poor performance of breastfeeding, there are several talents and barriers to breastfeeding. The first is lack of awareness and education. Insufficient knowledge about the benefits and the importance of breastfeeding leads to lower breastfeeding rates. And on the other, on, on the other hand, there is also an extensive marketing of breast milk substitutes or infant formula. And then the second is the socio and cultural norm. Norms and stigma surrounding breastfeeding can create barriers and impact the initiation and continuation of breastfeeding. In some cultures and communities, breastfeeding in public is still stigmatized or discouraged. This can make mothers uncomfortable or anxious about breastfeeding in public. And the third about the barriers from workplace and also societal support. The lack of supportive policies and breastfeeding friendly environment in adequate uh, amount of paid maternity leave also can make it more challenging for mothers to breastfeed while balancing other responsibilities. Many mothers face a lack of support from healthcare providers, family, and their communities. So adequate support is crucial for successful breastfeeding. Next slide. So now we speak the role of uh, breastfeeding in achieving SDGs. When we speak of sustain sustainable development, it's crucial to remember that sustainability is not just about the environment, er, environment but also about economic growth and social equity. Here, breastfeeding aligns with goal uh, number one of SDGs, which is no poverty. By reducing the financial burden associated with the price of infant formula, breastfeeding can help leave families out of poverty, enabling them to invest in education, in healthcare, and better living conditions for their children. Breastfeeding can also contribute to higher financial income for breastfed adults. A recent study has found that the adults who were breastfed had a 10% higher household income. So in this case, breastfeeding contributes to poverty reduction. Then breastfeeding also directly support goal, uh, SDGs goal number two, which is zero hunger. Breast milk is a sustainable, accessible, and affordable source of nutrition, ensuring that babies receive proper nourishment even in the most impoverished regions. Furthermore, breastfeeding also empower mothers by offering a natural and cost-effective solution to feeding their children, reducing the need for expensive infant formula and associated environmental costs. And perhaps the most obvious way breastfeeding aligns with the SDGs is through its impact on health and well-being. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number three seeks to answer goal health, good health and well-being for all. And breastfeeding plays a vital role in achieving this goal. Breast milk is a nature's perfect food for infant, providing all the essential nutrients and antibodies that protect, protect against disease. And by promoting breastfeeding, we can reduce infant mortality, improve overall child health, and also enhance maternal well-being, thus contributing to goal three success. And breastfeeding also aligns with goal uh, number four, which is quality of education. 
research shows that there is a positive correlation between breastfeeding and cognitive development, which is important for achieving quality education and lifelong learning. And lastly, breastfeeding also supports goal uh, eight of SDGs, which is decent work and economic growth. Breastfeeding women are, who are supported by their employers are more productive and loyal. Thus, maternity protection and other workplace policies can enable women to combine between breastfeeding and their other work or employment. Decent jobs should cater the needs of the breastfeeding woman, especially those in the typical or precarious situation. Next slide. So th there are several strategies actually that can be done to promote breastfeeding for SDGs. Uh, number one is through policy initiatives and support. Uh, policies that support breastfeeding, such as adequate maternity leaves, lactation break, and also breastfeeding friendly workplace can help bridge the gender gap that, and create more equitable opportunities for women in the workforce. And then the second is improving breastfeeding practice and counseling, enhancing breastfeeding knowledge and skills among healthcare professionals and providing effective counseling and support service for breastfeeding mothers is uh, really important. And the third is through creating breastfeeding friendly environments, establishing uh, support environments that enable mothers to breastfeed comfortably, including in public space and workplaces and also childcare facilities. All these strategies can be done to promote the breastfeeding for achieving the SDGs. Next slide. So to sum up this presentation, I would say that breastfeeding plays a critical role in achieving SDGs by promoting better health, reducing child mortality, and also supporting overall health uh, well-being. It is essential for all the individual, communities, and governments to prioritize and support breastfeeding to enter a brighter and also more sustainable future for all. So please join the movement toward achieving the SDGs, one of it by advocating for breastfeeding. Thank you very much for the time, Arancha, and then I return the time to you. Thank you. Hello. Um, hello. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sutantri. Please remember to write your questions in the Q&A function. And now I hand the floor to Esther Niokavi Kimani to present benefits for child health. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm very excited to talk about one of my favorite subjects, um, which is basically our babies, Our how are they fed? Um, next slide. And um, Dr. Sutantri has talked about breast milk being the liquid gold. And um, most moms would ask me, why are you talking about liquid gold? And we always talked about colostrum, about um, hind milk, about all the benefits that come up from the, the gold that is in them and just trying to help them um, become um, comfortable with breastfeeding and being able to support them. Okay, next slide. So when we talk about the first 1,000 days, we're talking about um, the first, from when the baby is conceived, which we count pregnancy to be 270 days, um, the first year of life, 365 days, and the second year of life, 365 days. Um, this is the time that basically um, is the foundation for a child's life. Um, and this is when their brain, um, their immune system, everything about them, social, social growth, psychological growth, everything about that baby is basically founded in those first 1,000 years. Uh, we know that breast milk is the most crucial source of nutrition for the first two years of an infant's life. And that being so, we know that if a baby does not receive the perfect nutrition from maternal stores when the mother is pregnant, and through the first two years of life, we know there is impaired cognitive and motor function, uh, poor growth and development. We know there's a weakened immune system. We know there's financial burden for, for the families because they have to cater for this baby who has an impaired 
um, growth or health issues. Um, we talk about when when Dr. Sutantri talked about um, um, being an effort like the poverty, the cycle of poverty is continued because this this particular child might not be able to go to school, might not be able to be able to get a good education because they're not able to even understand what they are doing in class. So when we talk about the first 1,000 days and breast milk being one of the key things um, for the benefit of that baby, um, we, we looked at it as one of the foundation stones for nutrition for the baby. Next slide, please. So, Breast milk, immunological properties. So we know that breast milk provides uh, protection against infection and allergies. Uh, breastfed babies will not get quite as sick as the ones that don't receive breast milk, um, especially when we are talking about initiating breastfeeding within the first hour of life, giving them that colostrum uh, basically gives that baby the first immunization, um, lines their gut, helps them to get the antibodies that they need, the IgG and the IgA, uh, which are important roles. Um, Ig, IgG is the most, uh, is the, antibodies that are prevalent in the body. Um, IgA is the mucosal properties enhancing it so that the baby has immunity and especially providing immunity against upper respiratory diseases. Um, the GI tract being able to be protected from antigens and microorganism. We talk about uh, breast milk being one of the protect protective, provides protective nature uh, for the baby against diarrhea, which is the leading cause of death in children below the age of five, uh, upper respiratory diseases, things like pneumonia, um, things like asthma, um, things like bronchitis. Um, for for preemies, we know that preemies are uh, a special, especially at risk uh, for getting infections, uh, for getting sepsis. And so we know that breast milk protects the baby's gut so that the baby is able to have protective layer uh, for the baby. Uh, when we talk about uh, preemies, we know that breast milk is different in the first, uh, if a mother is is has a premature baby, the breast milk will be slightly different from the full term, uh, full term baby. The breast milk for the preemie baby will be higher in uh, immunological properties. It will be higher in proteins. It will be able to protect the baby against um, um, infections that are prone to that time. It will give the baby much more fat and energy. So this also talks to how do we support that mother who has gotten a preemie baby to be able to breastfeed, to be able maybe to express milk. The baby might not be able to breastfeed, but can she express milk and the baby is given the milk instead of being given infant formula? Um, lots of conversations to be had there. Uh, breast milk is protecting against celiac disease. We know there's a lot of issues with the gut, a lot of issues with um, with uh, diabetes, a lot of issue with metabolic uh, diseases. So all these are protect. Breast milk is protected against all these Crohn's disease, um, um, type one and type two diabetes. Um, and this is basically a lot of times we find that uh, for for diabetes, um, the maturation of the gut and um, enhancing the gut microbiota is seen to be very protective against type 1 diabetes in children. It is prevalent right now. And the studies are showing that introducing cow's milk very early actually predisposes a child to type 1 diabetes. So very important to look at how do we support so that we protect our children. Um, next slide, please. So breast milk is the nature's perfect aid for growth and development. Um, the amazing thing about breast milk is that its composition changes dynamically um, through the hours of the day. Um, it, it's adapting to every infant's nutritional need, developmental, immunological needs. It supports the infant's growth around the clock so that um, studies show that milk in the morning will be different from milk in the afternoon, will be different from milk in the evening. Um, it helps the baby's metabolic growth, uh, thyroid hormones, uh, we talk about TSH, T3, T4, helping regulate metabolism and other functions, epidermal growth factors. It will help stimulate the cell growth, uh, the development and maturation of the GI tract. Uh, breast milk contains taurine, which is an amino acid essential for cell growth. 
Um, this taurin, it, the milk contains omega-3 oils, um, the PUFAs, what we call polyunsaturated fatty acids. They help the brain get the optimal brain development. Um, human milk will contain higher levels of, of, uh, of, of PUFAs um, than any other milk, any any milk that has been uh, that can be given, any substitute milk that can be given. Um, these oils are so so if, um, essential for visual growth, motor growth, cognitive development, um, and that's why children who are breastfed will definitely score higher in standardized school tests. They will do better in class. They will understand concepts better, and in this way, we have a, a very effective uh, human being in the future because I mean. Um, they they are getting better at it. When we talk about um, um, the the development of the jaw, there's a lot of conversations right now about how breastfeeding is so e effective in the development of the jaw and the teeth and the mouth. Um, when we talk about uh, one of the protective natures of breastfeeding against seeds, a sudden infant death syndrome. Um, we do know that uh, the, 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 as the baby is suckling, there's a lot of um, things that are happening. In 1987, um, researchers showed, uh, a research was done and showed that the longer the duration of breastfeeding, the lower the incidence of the, of the, bad, the bad bite, you know, the malocclusion, where you find that the teeth are pushed up. So what happens? The nipple is in the mouth and it's pulled in the mouth by the baby suckling motion. The facial muscles of the baby are working really hard to be able to express milk from the breast. And as that happens, as time goes on, the child's mouth, child's mouth muscles, the tongue presses against the upper palate, and that makes the bone, more bone to be deposited along the suture lines. And that means that uh, the mouth widens and the baby is able to have better teeth there's no more crowding of the teeth, you know, where we, we're finding a lot of babies right now crowding. So all these are benefits for the baby. Um, effect on the gut microbiome. Breastfeeding plays an important role in establishing a healthy microbiome. So we know the intestine is an ecosystem on its own. It is basically one of its role. It's a partner in the body, in the immune system. It's a great influence in the, in the immunity of a baby. So the intestinal of, of ecosystem of over 100 trillion living organisms, the bacteria, viruses, fungi, the aid in digestion, in uh, defending the body, in the synthesis of vitamins, in all the, all the things that are happening in the gut, uh, breast milk will provide that as, as the baby's breastfeeding. And this changes from day to day um, as the baby's breastfeeding. It contains beneficial bacteria, and prebiotics, you know, feeding at the breasts directly increases the transfer of beneficial organisms. So we are talking about the beneficial bacteria itself and the prebiotics, which is basically the food for the for the pre, for the probiotics. So all these things are found in the milk and um, plays a big role in regulating anxiety, mood, cognition, and even pain via the brain gut axis. We know that there is now a big connection between the gut and the brain. And the microbiome is affecting how a baby, a baby is able to, to I mean, the, the, the mental health of a baby and how the brain is able to function. Um, studies have linked breastfeeding with a lower occurrence of obesity in children and adults. Um, it has higher levels of peptin. So this is the hormone that basically regulates your appetite. So you're able to be able not to take too much calories and of course preventive of a um, long-term effects of obesity in the future. Next slide. So it helps establish the baby's sleep-wake cycle. Uh, one of the greatest um, comments I get from parents is, oh, my baby does not sleep. My baby's two years does not sleep. But we do know that breast milk helps the baby set their circadian rhythm. Um, and this that's why we're saying things are different. Um, hormones like glutocorin, corticoids and melatonin that are passed on from the mother's plasma to her milk, and they are passed on to the baby. Greatest benefit to encourage you to encourage the people that you support to breastfeed at night. A lot of people run away from breastfeeding at night, but we do know that melatonin is high, 
at night. And so when the babies are breastfed, they are being, they're being um, given a lot of melatonin, which will help develop their circadian rhythm. Breast milk during the day will have higher concentrations of fat, proteins, amino acid, and they will differ dramatically from day to night. Um, um, and it helps the baby actually um, start to know, like in the morning, it will have higher levels of, 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 of energy. And so the baby is able to be able to be awake, might not sleep for so long, but at night melatonin levels are there and baby sleeps for longer. By the age of 10 to 15 weeks, you find that, that now babies, circadian rhythm is more towards the parents. So you find the baby sleeping longer at night because they've been breastfeeding. So when babies, when mothers do not breastfeed at night, then the baby is not getting this benefit of getting higher melatonin levels in their body. Um, next slide, please. So psychological, mental, this is very clear, creates bonding experience. We, we promote skin to skin contact and we really want to really encourage that uninterrupted one hour after birth where the baby is able to just have an imprint of the mother um, as soon as they are born. Skin to skin in the first few weeks of life um, creates positive bonding. The frequent close interaction and attachment between mother and baby has that nurturing effect. It, it models positive behavior, which will create people who are empathetic, sympathetic, being able to connect with other people. Um, it provides uh, the baby with physical and emotional closeness. As the baby is breastfeeding, they're looking up at their mother, they're cramming their mother's face. They're feeling love, they're feeling that connection. It helps calm the infant and lowers incidences of colic. We know that babies who are breastfed have lower incidences of colic. Um, it gives the baby better endorphins, which helps the newborns deal with the stress of birth. I think being born is very stressful. You've been in this nice place and suddenly you're thrust into the world where there's lots of noises, lots of, uh, different smells, lots of different things that are going on. And this is very stressful to the newborn. But when they breastfeed, they get this better end of things. And it helps the baby adjust to life outside the womb. Um, next slide, please. So um, other benefits, learning, helping to, to um, imprint on the baby about the family's foods and family's tastes. Um, we know sweet, bitter, sour, you know, umami, the taste, the flavor of food, yeah, is passed on from the mother to through breast milk, right from the placenta um, and, and the amniotic fluid. But as the baby starts to breastfeed, if you usually eat a lot of chili, a bit of that chili goes into the baby's food, baby's breast milk, and the baby starts being acclimatized to the food in the family. And that will help ease off the baby during introduction of solids after six months. Um, and basically helps the baby have healthier choices. I usually um, encourage parents to eat healthy foods because they will imprint on the baby healthier choices in life. Um, it heals from inside in. I mean, um, when a baby has an eye infection, you can use a bit of milk. It will help clear that infection. A diaper rash, you know, um, babies with eye infection, um, the skin, uh, mothers will ask, can I put some breast milk in the baby's bath water? That's fantastic. It will help uh, clear some rashes or clear, help the baby have healthier skin. Um, if they have little cuts, they can put a bit of breast milk. And we do know that breastfeeding continues to benefit toddlers. It's the second year of life, contains significant concentration of total proteins, lactoferrin, and different immunoglob uh, immunoproperties and fats. All these things are, are beneficial to the baby. Um, next slide, please. Um, as I finish, um, Gabrielle Palmer, um, basically who, who wrote a very interesting book that I'd ask everyone to go and get and read called The Politics of Breastfeeding, said, if a multinational company developed a product that was nutritionally balanced and delicious, a wonder drug that both prevented and treated disease, cost almost nothing to produce and would be delivered in quantities controlled by the consumer's needs, the very announcement of their find would send their shares rocketing to the top of the stock market. The scientists who developed the product would win prizes and the wealth and influence of everyone involved would increase dramatically. Women have been producing such a miraculous substance, breast milk, since the beginning of human existence. Thank you all um, for, for being here. Thank you. What a quote to finish, Esther. Thank you very much.
Um, please remember to write uh, all your questions uh, for Esther in the Q&A. We are having already a few questions. And now um, I'm pleased to introduce um, our third uh, expert panelist, Mili Wanjiro Karina, presenting benefits for maternal health. Welcome, Mili. Thank you so, so much for having me. It's great to be here. Good afternoon. Good morning and good evening. I'm speaking to you all the way from Nairobi uh, in Kenya. And I'm excited again for breastfeeding because I am passionate about this topic and I want to be able to empower more healthcare professionals or more parents who are interested and are willing to do the, the, the job of breastfeeding exclusively until uh, six months and up to two years and beyond. Thank you so much, Esther, for that segment on the benefits for the, for the infant and the child. And I now want to cover the benefits for maternal health. Next slide. So we tend to focus a lot on the benefits for the infant. And even when you ask a mother who's just had her baby, you know, what do you think the benefit is for you choosing to breastfeed your baby? Many times she'll, she'll think of the benefits for her baby, but never will she think about her own benefits and what, uh, what the positive things are that she's doing to herself and her body by choosing to exclusively breastfeed. So the offer of the maternal breast to the baby is an unquestionable right of mothers and is of fundamental importance. However, the maternal benefits of breastfeeding are often neglected, especially in public health campaigns, we have the World Breastfeeding Week. We have many campaigns in the countries or wherever you may be in the world, but we forget about focusing and highlighting the maternal benefits. So today I want us to talk about the both, both the short-term and the long-term benefits for the mother. Next slide. So with this, we will talk about both immediate, which is short term, and the long term. So the immediate ones are quite uh, known, such as the involution of the uterus, reduction in bleeding postpartum, reduction in the risk of an infection. It will help with lactational aminorrhea, which I will cover, I'll talk a li little bit about. Reduced adiposity and weight for the mother, and reduced risk of postpartum depression, reduced stress and anxiety. Now, when we look at the long term, um, Tantri has alluded to this, that it does help to decrease the risk of a mother's, a mother's risk of breast and ovarian cancer, and there's also endometrium cancer. Diabetes, osteoporosis, blood pressure, cardiovascular diseases, metabolic syndromes, um, and even rheumatoid arthritis. Next slide. Now, if you focus on the involution of the uterus, so this pretty much means when the mother has just given birth, the placenta has been born, the, 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 um, the height of where the uterus was shrinks and it goes to the um, height of the umbilicus. So that's where in this image it shows the first day. So as soon as she gives birth, it shrinks and goes to the umbilicus. But every day, every day it shrinks going down, going down. And the result of this is because of early suckling. Early suckling causes a uterine contraction, which will accelerate the return of the uterus to its normal size. So mothers will complain of the after pains, which are a bit of cramping when she's nursing her baby. And she might notice a bit of, of bleeding every time she sits to nurse her baby. But what that is helping with a faster postpartum recovery for her. Now, there's also lactational aminorrhea. And this means that the mother will not menstruate for as long as she's exclusively breastfeeding. And this will help with pregnancy spacing uh, as a rise in oxytocin and prolactin, which are the milk uh, producing hormones, are suppressed. Well, no, suppress ovulation. They're not suppressed, those are high, but they suppress ovulation and in turn, the fertility of a woman. Then she will not menstruate. But three things must be full in full effect. So the mother must be exclusively breastfeeding, the baby is below six months and she should not be on her, she should not have gotten her menses. So if these three are in effect, then she can continue um, using breastfeeding as a form of natural contraceptive. Next slide. Now, 
there are postpartum mood disorders that arise. And just as this mother is looking at her baby, as she cradles and cuddles the baby, there is emotional bonding, both for the baby and both for the mother. And research studies have shown that oxytocin helps to stimulate the bond of the mother and the baby and improve maternal and emotional well-being. So approximately 13% of mothers experience postpartum depression. Now, what is so interesting is that the levels of oxytocin, which is the milk producing hormone, have been found to be lower in these mothers who are not breast, who have postpartum depression compared to the mothers without depression. So it shows that these mothers who are experiencing, the 13% who are experiencing postpartum depression are then having a lower rate of breastfeeding and thus the levels of oxytocin are low, then affecting them with postpartum depression. So it's a benefit for mothers to continue to breastfeed because it will help uh, reduce the risk of postpartum depression. Next slide. Weight loss. I think this is one of the benefits moms tend to, to talk about and to know that, yeah, if I choose to breastfeed my baby, then it will help me lose weight. So for breastfeeding, the body utilizes approximately 2,100 kilojoules per day, which is translated to 500 calories per day. And this will in turn cause a weight loss of about 450 grams per month. Now, the adipose tissue accumulated during pregnancy because of this weight loss will greatly reduce. So it will then lead to the weight loss. What's astonishing and what's so uh, interesting is that the amount of metabolic workload, it's actually said that when a mother is breastfeeding, the amount of energy she has spent to breastfeed in 24 hours is like her walking 11 kilometers per day. So her body is working hard. And this is associated with um, breastfeeding is with high workload then leads to a lower probability of developing coronary diseases, such as cardiovascular diseases. Now, this study um, that I've quoted here was conducted on 314 mothers in Mexico, found that those who were exclusively breastfeeding had a weight reduction of 4.1 kgs compared to those who did not breastfeed. Now, of course, because of that great weight loss, the burning of calories throughout the day will then reduce her risk of um, getting type two diabetes. And of course, with great weight loss, loss of the adipose tissue, then her self-esteem is high, her satisfaction, her body image is a lot greater. So that is a great benefit for moms as well as she continues to exclusively breastfeed. Next slide. Cardiovascular disease. So of course, with the weight loss and the burning of uh, the calories, that will, come, will affect the cardiovascular uh, system positively. Now, women who breastfeed for longer periods of time, so this is about seven to 12 months after the first delivery, have a 28% lower risk to develop vascular diseases compared to women who never breastfed. And now these findings are also associated with the weight loss and metabolic workload that I have mentioned, um, to which the maternal organi organism is submitted for the daily production of milk. And this can persist even after weaning, because even if she has started complementary foods for her baby, she's still going to continue breastfeeding. And we've been told by Esther that breast milk continues to be the main source of nutrition for one year, even to two years of a child's life. So her body is still working hard to, to make the milk. Now, women with a total breastfeeding time of more than two years had a 23% lower probability of developing coronary diseases than women who had never breastfed. So as you can see, there's a great benefit in ensuring that she has a lower risk of these diseases. Next slide. Now, it also protects against breast cancer. Now, when I looked at this uh, study by Muguya, which is was done in 2017, it found that exclusive breastfeeding among paras women, so women who've given birth, reduces the risk of breast cancer compared to women who'd given birth and who had never breastfed. So the risk was much lower. When they compared this group of women who have breastfed, those who haven't, the ones who had breastfed had a much lower risk. Next slide. 
Now, this was an exciting literary liter find for this literature review as I did my research. I came across this study by Chen, done this year, September of 2023, and it was looking at their breastfeeding, how breastfeeding averts breast cancer development. And when you look at this image, it talks about it decreases the FOXA1, which is the forehead box A1, which is an interacting partner of both estrogen and androgen receptors. And they both play a crucial role in the development and progression of breast cancer, okay? So now breastfeeding reduces and decreases that. When you look at the PAPP, is a pregnancy associated plasma protein A. Protein produced by the, it's a protein produced by the placenta and the levels will go increasing um, until the mother reaches term and delivers. However, after that, high levels of this protein can be associated with the progression of other tumors. So again, with breastfeeding, it decreases this protein, uh, protein's activity. Then we look at the um, module cell environment. So the calcium specific hemoglobin A and that LALBA, which is alpha lactal albumin. I'm sorry, this is a bit technical, but I just wanted you to understand what all those letters mean that albumin suppresses breast cancer cell development now it breastfeeding does this by ensuring that that is suppressed uh, there's also the suppression and the promotion of normal involution of breast tissue now the involution of the breast tissue is that the cells are lost with aging it's a natural process with aging of the mammary glands and it can reduce um, the effect or the incident of a mother experiencing or having breast cancer risk. So th that's one of the benefits of, re of breastfeeding. It's very big in terms of ensuring that breast cancer is reduced. However, there were some limitations. Next slide. When this study was done by Chell, Chen, uh, there were questions that were raised regarding breastfeeding and they're reducing the risk of breast cancer. So the questions were, how much breastfeeding is required to mitigate this risk? Is three months sufficient? Is seven months sufficient? Does it have to be 12 months? How much is enough? The other question is the first or the last pregnancy more pivotal or is complete breastfeeding month duration key in the risk reduction? And the other one was, what are the potential compounding effects of MENAC? age, which is, Menak is the first, um, the, the year the, the girl starts to menstruate. So maybe 14, 13, 15. Some now are menstruating very early, 10 years, 11 years. That, that Does that have a confounding effect on breastfeeding association in terms of the breast cancer risk? Alongside other lifestyle factors, such as oral, oral contraceptive use, alcohol consumption, and BMI. Do these have a confounding effect on increasing the risk of breast cancer or not? So these are more studies that will need to be done. Next slide. So in conclusion, allow me to say that lactation plays an important role in maternal recovery from pregnancy and can be determine multiple aspects of maternal health in later life. We've seen the long-term and the short-term effects and the benefits for, for the mother. Now, my passion is ensuring that prenatal education on breastfeeding is done and it is of paramount importance. And the benefits for both maternal and the infant, the health and well being should be shared during these uh, sessions, as well as encouraging mothers to seek breastfeeding support early. Because you find the mothers who are not uh, supported in good time, they tend to quit really early. But the mothers who get the right support, the timely support, tend to be more successful in breastfeeding. And that's what we want. We want to ensure that these mothers are successful. Thank you so much for the indulgence. Thank you, Millie. Thank you. Thank you very much for your session. And now we will commence the Q&A session with our three experts. Just a reminder, if you're joining us on Zoom, please ask your questions in the Q&A section. 
And uh, we will answer as many questions as possible during this uh, workshop. And if we don't have time to answer all your questions, we will compile them and address them later after the session. So let's start with uh, a question for Dr. Uh, for Tantri, Dr. Sutantri. What are, oops, my, oh, somebody has put back the document. Thanks, Louis. Uh, what are the most effective strategies to promote and support breastfeeding in Indonesia? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the question, Aranja. Yeah, uh, so uh, the best way actually to promote and supporting breastfeeding in Indonesia actually needs a collaborative approach as well, involve various stakeholders with governments and healthcare provider and also communities and families. But some of the uh, most effective strategies, I think the first one is education and awareness because public awareness campaign is really important as well. And then in Indonesia, uh, actually the policies and legislation also is uh, really important. Yes, indeed, in Indonesia, we have the law uh, referred to labor law that guarantees that female workers have three months of maternity leave with, with full uh, wages or full salary throughout the period. But uh, based on the law, Indonesia maternity protection scheme is fully funded by the employers and not based on social security. So in that case, well, the woman who work or the mother who work in the small enterprise or small business, then it's not always their choice to get the full wages or full salary. So I think it's really important for the government to enact and enforce the maternity protection law uh, that provide paid maternity leave and time for breastfeeding breaks for uh, working mothers. And then the... Third one is also the implementation of the baby friendly hospital initiative. It's a uh, what is in, in Indonesia is not all the hospital uh, state or declare themselves as baby friendly hospital initiative. So usually in the hospital is still allowed for the uh, the mother to bring bottle and sometimes it's also like the you know, you know the the nurse even give the give the the, the milk uh, the formula in the first twenty four hours and something like that. So I think it's important as well to encourage hospital to adopt the baby friendly hospital hospital initiatives, and also research and data collection. Also, it's really really important because we need to know like the data of the breastfeeding rates, practice, and also challenge from uh, to inform the evidence based policies and also the programs for the government. So all the programs programs that are being created by the government is based on the evidence and the challenge that happen in the community. So I think I think that's Arantia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tantri. I've got the next question for Esther. Um, is what are the long-term health benefits of breastfeeding that persist into, into adulthood? There was somebody that wanted to dwell more into, into this. Mm. So all the benefits, as we say, the first 1,000 days is like the foundation of the health, um, um, like the health future of that person. So we're talking about um, uh, metabolic met metabolism being well developed. We're talking about growth and development. We're talking about the gut microbiome, the gut, actually what lines the gut. So that helps with digestion. And if the baby breastfeeds, then that foundation is set. And that means even in the future, those people have lower risk of diabetes, obesity, uh, metabolic disease, other metabolic uh, disorders like high blood pressure. So uh, we're talking about high intelligence scores. So that means that person will be more productive in the future. So when this baby, everything about breastfeeding is actually geared towards the benefits into adulthood of this particular baby. Yeah, I think I've, I hope I've answered that question, yeah. Thank you, Esther. Next question for Millie. What are the most common misconceptions about breastfeeding for women? Yeah, thank you, Arantxa, that's a good question. One of the misconceptions is that breastfeeding should be painful that it's normally painful. So already these moms are expecting to endure pain. And when they do, they, they think, you know what? My breasts, my nipples just need to toughen up, toughen up and I will be able to breastfeed finally without pain. Breastfeeding can be painful, but it should not be painful. 
So if it is painful, this mother needs to get the right support to be shown how to attach the baby on the breast, how to position herself and her baby. The other misconception is that um, the breast mothers will never produce enough breast milk and she has to keep expressing and storing milk and ensuring that she's always leaking and is full. It doesn't mean that if you're not full or your breasts are not so engorged and leaking, it doesn't mean that you don't have enough milk. You will still produce enough milk for your baby as long as you're breastfeeding on demand. Another misconception is that moms tend to complicate breastfeeding further by ensuring that they always wipe their breast and their nipple area every time they want to breastfeed. So if they're sitting down to breastfeed for eight to or 10 times a day, they will clean their breast and their nipple eight to 10 times a day or more. You don't need to do that because we have the, around there areola is the Montgomery gland, which is a self-cleaning gland and you do not have to wipe it. Actually, when you keep cleaning it, you tend to make yourself more susceptible or the nipple area more susceptible to a yeast infection. You produce a beautiful smell that the baby recognizes. You produce good uh, oils and good uh, bacteria. So no need to complicate it, complicate it further by having to wipe your, your breast. The final one I'll say is that some people believe that if a mother is sick, she should not breastfeed at all. And it's a misconception because most times you can breastfeed your baby as long as you're not undergoing chemotherapy or you're not on certain drugs that you've been told you're going for a CT scan and you're going to be given iodine and you know that you will not breastfeed. But most times you can and you should be able to breastfeed your baby even if you're sick. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Millie. Following this, we've got a question that asks, can a seropositive mother who has not been adherent to ART, who has just delivered, also initiate breastfeeding within the first hour postpartum? That's a tricky one because we know the uh, antiretroviral therapy is um, there to prevent the mother from transmitting this virus to her baby. Now, of course, if she transmits the virus to her, she's not taking the antiretroviral therapy, she will tend to transmit the virus to her baby. So the baby will be born probably seropositive as well. So I will add encourage everyone is to ensure that we are counseling our mothers, those who are seropositive to ensure that they are adhering to their medications because these days with the right um, uh, prenatal support for mother and child, they can endure, you can have a seropositive mother with a HIV negative baby. Yeah. Thank you, Millie. I've got another question. Um, can one of the challenges to effective breastfeeding in our generation today is cosmetics and uh, surgical interference and adjustment mm -hmm. uh, can maybe affect uh, effective breastfeeding in our young mothers to be? Who would like to take this one? I, I think I can take that one. Um, to some extent, yes, it can. I'm actually currently dealing with one who had gotten cosmetic surgery, breast reduction, and a big factor of it is uh, from the scar tissue where the incisions were made, if they interfered with the breast tissue, with the ducts. So yes, to some extent, there are some people who can breastfeed uh, comfortably, but a big, would say 50-50, will not be able to actually get enough milk. Uh, or sometimes they do get milk, but the scar tissue creates problems so that there's lots of blockages and that blockages, that means that we have to stop breastfeeding because they they end up with lots of abscesses and mastitis. Um, so again, uh, part of it is, as especially healthcare workers, actually looking at the breast because sometimes they probably need to do a scan so that they can be, we can see how the breast tissue is, how the ducts are, to be able to support that uh, mother to breastfeed. Yes. Thank you, Esther. Following what you mentioned on mastitis, we've got a question that asks: Can a breastfeeding mother with mastitis and or breast access be advised to continue breastfeeding? Yes, actually, with mastitis, we do. Um, there's there's a whole new mastitis protocol that we're doing now, which involves continuing to breastfeed so that you can empty the breast. Um, no more expressing. Um, you avoid actually expressing because expressing will actually cause more milk to be made and you want to kind of reduce the milk in there. We use lots of cold packs, 
not heat. We use lots of cold packs and trying to pack the breast with uh, cold to reduce the inflammation. Uh, we avoid massaging, you know, the deep tissue massage that we see commonly done and basically continue to breastfeed. With an abscess, it depends on, on what um, the surgeon will 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 um will will give instructions to the patient sometimes with an abscess the mother might just be able to hand express a little to reduce the milk but not quite breastfeed depending on where the incision again was made but if the incision was made in an area where is away from the nipple then the baby can continue to breastfeed uh but probably not mean as as many times as they would in the breast that does not have the abscess yes Thank you, Esther. Following uh, what Tantri was presenting, there was one of um, one of our attendees was asking. Oh, did I mean lose? Uh, did, 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 how can we best support working class mothers who um, exclu exclusively breastfeed, and uh, and how to promote breastfeeding? Uh, I'll read again. What can be done for employees to promote breastfeeding practice, including exclusive breastfeeding? And uh, they were asking about, and this might be a tricky one, Tantri, um, it's about what evidence is there regarding this? Maybe they would like to present that to the employer. And if you don't know this one yet, uh, we can also send information later. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, maybe for the evidence, we can send information later. But uh, I think it is important to support the employees to uh, do the exclusive breastfeeding through implementing the breastfeeding friendly workplace. Like uh, the first step, like let's say create breastfeeding friendly workplace by providing lactation rooms. I think that's really important. It needs to be enacted in every, every workplace. Uh, they must provide lactation room. And also, I think for the breastfeeding mom, they need like flexible, more flexible working hours because uh, usually when they start to go back to work like in Indonesia actually the, the maternity leave is only for three months and usually one and a half month is in the end of the pregnancy and then one and a half month is like after they deliver the baby so it's like the early beginning of the of the motherhood so I think it's flexible working hour is really important because uh, when they leave the baby then they need to express the milk and everything so every two hours they need to have break so flexible working hour will be a really important to support the the mother to provide exclusive breastfeeding for the for the baby and also the paid maternity leave also uh, it's really important as in Indonesia it's not being covered in the security national security but it only depends on the employer so uh, it's kind of hard for the micro or small uh, enterprise to support fully support for their 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 employee and uh, for the also maybe for the business uh, business sector also the comply I think actually the marketing practice of the infant formula usually it's really massive here of the 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 commercials of the infant formula but they also need to comply with the regulation re related to the marketing of the breast milk substitutes to uh, you know and refrain from promoting infant formula products in a way that kind of undermine the breastfeeding so I think that, that, that there are some some steps that can be done to promote the exclusive breastfeeding or to support the uh, working class mothers to do the exclusive breastfeeding. Or maybe Esther and Millie also can add to the, the answer. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I think you've done a great job. We've got to promote lactation rooms in the workplace to ensure that the mothers can come to work and be able to express milk and carry it home back to to the to the babies. Here in Kenya, we are allowed to we have a policy which is the breast milk substitute act that allows mothers in the workplace one extra hour on top of their lunch break to be able to ex to breastfeed their baby or to actually pump. So that hour you can use it for full 60 minutes. You can break it out into three 20, 20, 20 minute sessions or two sessions. But you should be able to um, advocate for this in your workplace that you should be allowed if you're a lactating mother for about a year, you can be able to do that in the workplace. Thank you, Millie. And thank you, Tantri. Uh, we've got a question. Is mothers in our part of the world are malnourished? Please highlight the nutritional nutritional needs of uh, mothers when talking about exclusive breastfeeding? Maybe Millie 
or it, well, anyone. Um, okay, so um, to be able to breastfeed, basically you need a balanced diet. Uh, we're talking about um, high calorie foods, uh, which are carbohydrates. We need lots of protein. Um, we need, um, you know, uh, fruits and vegetables that can be able to form that balanced diet. We need healthy fats. And we do know in areas of the of the world where people are malnutrition, these are, are sometimes hard to come by. But we work with what is locally available, what is locally available to that mother. A lot of times it's misconceptions about what exactly you should eat. Uh, what you eat really does not does not affect the production of milk. What makes milk is actually baby. We call it the three Bs, baby, breast, and brain. When the baby comes to the breast, they stimulate the milk, the milk will be made. So there's a lot of misconception that I need to eat so much more food to be able to make milk. We just need that baby on the breast. But um, the mother does need to hydrate well and does need to eat. So in areas where uh, information is given, um, that whatever is locally available, um, giving, um, um, giving things that can help these people actually have enough food. They can plant some vegetables in, in pots right next, even, even in the slums or in areas where they don't have farmland to farm. They can use buckets to grow vegetables. They can have an egg that can be shared, two eggs instead of getting an egg every person. They can buy a piece of fruit and share it amongst the family. So trying to give them um, information and trying to give them strategies that will help them uh, get that balanced diet and that nutritional, what, what Millie was talking about, giving that prenatal education and nutritional information and working with them what is available and how can you eat to be able to sustain your baby and have energy. Uh, breastfeeding in itself um, is not really influenced by what the mother is eating because the macronutrients, what we are talking about, the proteins, the fats, the carbohydrates are standard. What might miss is the micronutrients, things like calcium, like, like um, zinc and iron. Those might miss if the mother does not eat a fully balanced diet. But again, we talk about counseling. Um, nutritional counseling is key in being able to sustain, to help this mother sustain breastfeeding. Thank you, Esther. I think this question may be for you as well. Um, we've got our, one of our participants uh, was asking, please, more explanation on breastfeeding and eye infection. Uh, okay. So yes, um, you can. Um, a long time ago, uh, even um, talking to my grandmother, when a person had an eye infection, they would look for the breastfeeding mother um, and they would get some milk and put in the eye. Okay, that has since stopped since the incidence of HIV and, and, and other communicable diseases. But yes, you can put some breast milk. It needs to be fresh, so freshly expressed, expressed into a spoon and put on an eye infection. Of course, if the eye infection does not clear within a few days, you can see your health provider, healthcare provider. But yes, it's great for clearing eye infections. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question, um, Dolly Mori, to what strategies should be taken to combat a poor nutritional education through advertisements on children's diet through audiovisual media? Well, this might be a bit, uh, I thought it was more about breastfeeding. Um, let me see. Um, we've got some questions that they are about um, the breastfeeding in itself, about how, what temperature should women that they are expressing at work should keep the milk before they go home. And some people are asking as well, is it enough to feed only for a year? Who would like to talk more about these two topics? I can take that. Thank you, Arancha. For the storage of milk, if you are expressing and you do not have an access to a fridge or a freezer, the milk can stay in a cool place for four to six hours. As long as it's not in direct sunlight or anywhere well warm for four to six hours, it can stay in a cool counter. If the mom has an access to a cooler bag, then it can be stored there and you can transport that milk in the cooler bag and take it into the fridge when we get home. When you get home, the milk that you have expressed can last four days in the fridge. 
and it can last four to six months in a freezer, depending on where you live. And the, if there's a lot of electricity fluctuation, then ensure that that milk will be used much more often because once it has thawed in the freezer because of a lack of electricity, you've got to use it within 24 hours after it has thawed. So you might not need to over over pump. One of the things I would like to remind everyone that is we should focus on feeding the baby and not the freezer. Because these days, many people keep want, want to fill their fridge and freezer with so many packets of milk to feel that like, yeah, we're doing so well and ensuring that we have enough milk for our baby, but we're not feeding the baby. So those are that you can use that, but think about let's feed the baby. The freezer will come. So another question I've seen on the chat is about a baby refusing the bottle and the baby's four months. You can actually cup feed if the baby has totally refused to drink from the bottle. Use a cup, it's okay. Question Thank you. was about. Second yes. question. Oh, the, the second question. Oh, um, I'll just go to that one because I was only a year. One, but it will come to me. Okay. Tanchi, you got it? Oh, it look, I still remembers. Yeah, it was about ex, um, um, just uh, feeding for a year. I saw somebody yeah. also yes. commenting yes. that yeah. milk after the first year yeah. is just water. It's actually not. It is actually still very, very beneficial to the toddler. The toddler is starting to move around, is starting to um, experience the world. And that milk has a lot of high proteins, um, high fats that help the development of the brain as the baby is learning how to talk, how to walk, how to move. And then it also has a higher levels of immunoglobin properties, almost quite as high as the early milk of the colostrum. So the breast milk is still very, very, very key to the baby. And somebody, I think also I saw a question asking, is there a side effect for breastfeeding until after the age of two? There is no side effect. As long as both the, the, the baby and mama are happy, they can continue for as long as they like. There's really no side effect. That's okay, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think we might have time to two more questions. What are the alternative therapies uh, uh, rather than medications available to enhance breast milk secretion among the lactating mothers, especially during puerperal period, postnatal period? Who would like to take that one? I'll take that one. Um, for supply, it's simple. If you've heard of demand and supply, it also is in on the breast. The more the mother will demand from the breast, the more the supply. So if you want to increase your supply, keep putting the baby on demand. Every time, even if they've fed an hour ago and you're thinking, how can they want to feed again? Keep your baby on the breast to, to ensure that the demand is there because the body keeps getting the message that, okay, let's make more milk. Another one is expressing after a feed because again, it's demand. The body will get the message that, oh, we need to produce more milk and you'll be able to, to get milk to store for later. I just feel like we need, really need to balance this thing for expressing because then moms focus more on that expression, but it's a way of naturally without using any medication for the baby to be, for the mother to be able to produce more milk. So that's the simple, simplest thing that you can do. Staying away from stress as well. Being able to rest and again having a well balanced diet and staying well hydrated. Thank you. Thank you. you say something. Um, if uh, if nobody, uh, we just do one last question. I think uh, um, is postpartum depression may affect breastfeeding. Um, if a mother is convinced uh, her breast milk is not adequate and the infant is just one month old, what can be done? Who would like to um, take I think I can take that one. A lot of times, uh, inadequate breast milk is perceived. Um, there's a lot of people who think that I have to, my breasts, they've been told your breasts are too small or they're not feeling heavy. I think Millie talked about that. They're not feeling like their breast is heavy. Or the baby, that they have um, an inadequate understanding of how breastfeeding works. Most people think that I'll feed my baby and then my baby will sleep for three hours. But basically, most babies will continually be coming to the breast. 
um, they do what we call cluster feeding, where they'll come to the breast and after half an hour, they're like, oh, I want to eat. And then after one hour, I want to eat. And a lot of time that's normal newborn behavior. So again, prenatal uh, education to understand how a newborn works. Uh, baby might have other issues, might be gassy, might be um, having fussiness because of gas but then they, they are told you don't have enough milk. So we found studies have shown that probably around 60% of the people who think that they don't have enough milk have adequate milk. So the first thing to ask them, the, 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 the breastfeeding uh, person is, are you having wet diapers? Are you having 10 to 12 diapers in 24 hours? Um, is the baby adding weight? When you go to, to the doctor to weigh the baby, to your healthcare provider, the baby is being weighed, they're adding weight adequately. The baby looks content after a feed. And basically, if all those tick the box, then we know that you actually have adequate milk. When somebody does not have adequate milk, then we'll know the baby will not thrive. The baby will not have wet diapers. And that's when we recommend that you seek help from a lactation specialist so that you can be supported to be able to get to the right way. So support, support, support for those ones who actually do not have enough milk. Yeah. Thank you. I think we might squeeze out just a one minute answer for one last question. Um, um, what education would be advisable to give a young teenage girl who is expecting her first baby? around breastfeeding. Who would like to take it? Millie? Yep. I'll go ahead. Um, for a teenage baby, uh, for a teenage girl, <laughs> she needs to be encouraged to breastfeed. I think one of the things she probably will be concerned about is exposing her breasts or affecting the shape and size of her breasts if she breastfeeds her baby, but she needs to be encouraged that regardless of that, the fact that she has been pregnant will either loosen her mammary, the ligaments, and she needs to be encouraged and told that the benefit for her baby and for herself uh, with breastfeeding is of high importance. This is um, a, a somebody who has to have a support person with her, and most likely somebody who has breastfeeding education. So a breastfeeding specialist, a lactation consultant should be able to walk hand in hand with this girl to ensure that she knows how to attach this baby because most times if she experiences discomfort on the breast, she will give up. Okay. So she needs that encouragement, somebody to walk hand in hand with her ensuring that she will be successful in it because it's very possible. But many times women give up in the beginning because of the, the challenges that they may experience in the early days. Thank you, Millie, and thank you, all the speakers. Just a reminder about certificates of attendance. If you would like to receive a certificate of attendance, you need to complete the, the feedback survey. It's important to enter two details. One is the title of the session, that is Lacta Hub Workshop, exploring the benefits of breastfeeding and breast milk, and the code for today, that is today's date, is the 07-11-23, so 7th of November 23. And uh, the, the certificates will be sent to those participants who have attended a minimum of 80% of this session, and it will be sent within a month of the workshop. And for more information, there is a website that is being just posted on the chat. And uh, next slide, please. And uh, a quick reminder that this session has been recorded and will be available soon on Lacta Hub. And my sincere thanks to our special guest, Dr. Alice Lakati, Dr. Sutantri, Este, Nio Kabikimani, and Mili Wanjiru Karina for your time, for sharing your experience today, and to you, to the participants, for your engagement, and to our team, Kai, Louis, Zainab, and Alex, for all the work in the background. Please help us develop and improve Lacta Hub workshop, uh, workshops by completing the feedback uh, form that will be sent following this event. And so, to close today's workshop, I would like once again to thank all the speakers and the audience and wish you all a good rest of your day. Thank you and bye-bye. Great session. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Arantia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.